Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm Alton Gansky in Central California, the author of uh, about 44 books, mostly fiction, and a good number of non-fiction books. Good to be with you, Aaron. Well, good to have you along. You are uh, a little under the weather tonight, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Last few days have been uh, it's been pretty rough. So, you know, but I put it on my brave face, you know, my big boy pants. Um, and I'll apologize to the listening and viewing audience if, um, you know, I suddenly start clutching at my throat and growing hair all over my body and fangs and whatever else might happen with that. There may be some coughing. Yeah. There may be, be some there, uh, cough drops. Sure. I'm here. You're kind of cutting in and out, so I feel like those are some really good jokes here. Well, I'll save them for the next time I'm sick. <laughs> All right, fantastic. <laughs> so you're a little under the weather, um, and we've got a lot of our normal listeners who are uh, meeting together tonight for what they call a writer's salon. And so... Uh, we've got some familiar faces that will not be joining us in the chat room tonight. Molly Joe, Mary Ruth Hughes, etc. Uh, that will not be with us tonight. Uh, they'll probably watch later, obviously, maybe download the audio, but uh, can't join us live uh, because of that. So we'll have a smaller crowd in our, our room watching us, but that's all right. We've got Ginny, Ginny Snow along watching, so we're happy to have her here. And uh, speaking of Mary Ruth Hughes, uh, my first lane Fridays, we had that on Friday, the very first one, had a few responses, and Mary Ruth Hughes is our lucky winner for the week. And her first line that she submitted was, Father said the scavenger man would be coming today to clean out the privy. <laughs> so I, I thought that's that's pretty fair. That's, uh, I've often said that's the best good first lines. That's pretty uh, good one. The best first lines are those that make you say, huh? And have to read the second line. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. The best lines are the ones that make you say, huh? You're really kind of cutting out some. Uh, it's kind of intermittent. So hopefully we'll be able to get that resolved soon. But um, so Mary Ruth Hughes, congratulations. That means you are now one of our weekly winners and our monthly winners. Uh, we'll get the $15 gift card and the yearly winner will be get a $50 gift card. So you're eligible for both of those. And that's really exciting. Thanks for all who participated. Jenny Snow also sent in one from a, a romance novel, I believe that she's working on. Um, and don't forget to check out my Facebook page on Fridays. You can submit your first lines then all through the weekend. Uh, I usually pick, I, I decided to pick the winner on Mondays, but I think now we'll start picking them on Wednesday nights during our podcast. We'll do it live. It'll be some some hoopla, some extravaganza. So you can uh, submit lines essentially Friday through Wednesday um, to be eligible. And uh, that's on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Aaron D. Gansky is where I'll post that. And then every month on my uh, First in Fiction, First Line Friday, you'll see the uh, the address there on my bar. Uh, that's where I'll post the, uh, the monthly winners so that we can uh, vote on those. So thanks all for participating in that. And uh, let's go ahead and move right along to the publishing term of the day. So Pops, you've got Indicap for us tonight. Yeah, Indicap. But first I want to know, will there be balloons, cake? Probably, uh, but if there are, that will have to come out of the gift card money um, because I'm poor. So <laughs> you're a teacher, uh, maybe, you're poor. Maybe, yeah, maybe some virtual balloons and virtual cake. It doesn't taste quite as good when you're gnawing on the corner of your computer, but it's the thought that counts, as I understand it. Sure. So. Doesn't have to be new cake. Yeah, let's talk about what an end cap is. Uh, an end cap is what you see when you walk into a bookstore and you see bookshelves, and at the end of the bookshelves, usually facing out towards the door or to the aisleways where book buyers are, uh, you'll see a set of books, usually in a cardboard uh, set of shelves. It's usually one book or it might be two or three from a particular publisher, uh, but it's it's a special place. And uh, I used to go in there and think, wow, those guys must be bestsellers to be able to get that kind of exposure in a bookstore. Really what happens is you buy it. Uh, the, the space in the bookstore is 
uh, sellable, and so some publishers will buy in cap as part of the promotion. And what it does is it gets your book off the shelf and makes it stand alone so other people can find it easier than if it's up there with all these other books of similar color and titles. Those are called end caps. And you see those in retail everywhere. It's not just in your Barnes and Noble, but you'll see it at Target and, and Walmart, etc. And like you say, it increases the visibility. Uh, it's a lot harder to find books when they're all stacked on shelves alphabetically and they get you know, disorganized as people come through and replace books where they don't belong, et cetera. So having just a bunch of your books sitting out there on the end, um, it's going to catch the eyes of those who are passing by, uh, et cetera. So it is, it's a good place to be. And, and you're, you say the publisher is the one who buys that. Is it possible? Um, I know we've got some people who are self-published who listen in. Is it possible for self-published authors to buy that space as well? Well, it's possible. But with self-publishing, you're also the distributor. And most bookstores have to pull from some distributor, and uh, most of us self-published won't be recognized as distributors. So there are different ones who, like Ingram, who uh, put out the books and the like. And they're starting to do a program with self-published writers uh, where they serve as the distributor. So you might be able to work through them on it. I have not seen that done, and it would be pretty costly. Publishers only do it if they think they're going to recoup. So it's usually some writer that either has a killer idea, a huge following, um, you know, big database, that sort of thing, uh, or has been a bestseller in the past. So it's not unusual to go in and see Stephen King on NCAP, you know, or um, Martin or someone like that on an NCAP uh, because they know they're going to make the money back. Yeah, absolutely. They've got the track record of sales to back it up. So that's um, yeah, that's the irony, and it's it's difficult for some writers to learn or to accept. But the irony in publishing is the people who get the advertising dollars are those who don't need it. They're best sellers anyway. But because they're best sellers, the publisher feels they can recoup the money, so they'll pour money in to sell more books. And it's kind of a you know cyclic logic, but they've been doing it long enough that they must have some track record to say that this really works. But if you're a new writer, uh, most of the time that's not going to happen for you uh, until it takes off and then they'll start doing any number of things. I remember Jerry Jenkins and some of the Left Behind books and they were just all over the store. But that's because uh, he'd been selling millions of them. He and um, his writing partner had been selling millions of them. Yeah, absolutely. The names move the books. So, yeah. uh, so that is end cap. Excellent. And uh, this week we are talking about, in a very choppy transition here, uh, moving from in caps to animals. I couldn't find a smooth transition for that, so you get what I've got tonight. And that is uh, a, a choppy transition. So animals in fiction is what we're talking about tonight. Kind of an interesting concept. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back, uh, Hand of Adonai has an animal in it, uh, an animal character, if you will. There are several animals that they fight, some monsters, etc. But we're not really talking about your kind of monsters that you're fighting against, uh, not necessarily talking about animals as antagonists, though we, we will eventually get there. Um, we're talking more about just the use of common animals within your fiction. And so I thought we'd start off a little bit just to, to kind of show, to demonstrate that it's an important topic. Um, I thought we might mention some of the authors who have used animals in their fiction and uh, often do it. So the first one that comes to my mind is, is Jack London, uh, known for uh, The Call of the Wild, um, To Build a Fire, which uh, Literary Roadhouse recently covered. Um, and in each of his stories, he writes about you know the Yukon and, and up north, the ice, the dog sleds, all that kind of stuff. In each of his works, he's got some sort of sled dog, um, husky, something like that that's, that's up in the wild, on the ice and the snow, um, either writing from their point of view, but not always, um, but often writing from their point of view. Uh, usually it's dogs, and in To Build a Fire, it's interesting because you've got the man's point of view, and then you've got his companion, the dog's point of view, and the characters that kind of work together and help develop each other in a lot of ways. So Jack London is definitely one who uh, who does it quite often. Uh, how about Dean Koontz, Pops? 
And Dean Kunst is uh, well known for this, primarily uh, with dogs, sometimes with creatures, too, uh, that aren't necessarily animals, but um, they're uh, developments of imagination. But Dean Kuntz has, has got a name for himself of, uh, of putting dogs in, especially golden retrievers. He had a golden retriever named Trixie for the longest time. Dog passed away a number of years ago, and it was devastating to him. Uh, it was, I think, the I think he would say that it was the only child that they had, and that can be uh, can be hard to do that. But dogs play a big role in that. And I think one of the first times I saw that was in one of his older books called Watchers, which is a, a great book. Uh, it was turned into a poor movie, uh, but nonetheless, the book was great, and it's about a, a golden retriever that a man. Uh, meets up with, begins to take care of, and he soon realizes that this dog has an extreme intelligence, uh, far beyond what any dog would have, but the dog can't speak. And so they end up working out a communication system. And then there is the ugly creature, which is the opposite of the uh, golden retriever. Uh, it's ugly, it's mean, and it's a killer, and it's coming after the dog. So it's really a story about saving the dog. Um, and the government wants to get the dog back because of all the money spent to make it special. Uh, but he's done that in a, a great many books, and it's not unusual to find a golden retriever somewhere. Uh, it could be another type of dog, but it's often a golden retriever somewhere in a Dean Kuntz book. Um, it's very important. And he did one time do a point of view uh, from the dog. I thought it was, it was funny because I didn't think anyone could do that. Um, but he did it, and the dog is trying to find a lost boy and he's dogs encouraging himself saying dog not bad dog dog not bad dog dog good dog sniff sniff boy uh dog good boy cat 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 and he runs across the street he's chasing a the cat then he comes back and starts looking for the boy he's trying to get the idea of the dog mentality i always thought that was incredibly funny um but the animal was uh key to to the story and he's been able to do that uh, several times so the dog had add yeah, that would, <laughs> that's right. Squirrel. So, yeah, yeah CDD, cat they, uh, distraction. They've got uh, they do that in Up as well, where they put the uh, the little speaker box on the dog, and it's just like a oh, lot squirrel, squirrel. Yeah. So yes. it's kind of fun. Uh, Stephen King writes from the point of view of a dog in Under the Dome, uh, which I've mentioned before. He also writes from the point of view, I believe, of a bird, definitely of a groundhog, uh, and that's always interesting. Or, I'm not sure I. Uh, I is it an Amardillo? I, I don't I, remember. Yeah, it was a long time ago. It was just one scene. But he does write from the point of view of the dog. And as much as I wasn't a fan of it, he did it well in the sense that it actually played a part in the, the solution to the story. Like, it, it furthered the plot. This dog furthered the plot. And without this dog, the plot would not have been resolved the way it was. And so at least there, you know, uh, kind of like you were saying with Dean Koontz, the dog is playing a role here. So if we're in the point of view of the animal, the animal should have some sort of unique perspective or work together, you know, with, with the other characters to help resolve the conflict. Uh, and, and to build a fire by Jack London, uh, the dog is there and we get into his perspectives predominantly because the dog makes judgments about the man. And so we get to understand who this man is and why he's there and what he's doing. Uh, which we otherwise would not have, have known about this particular man. Uh, we understand who this guy is based on how he treats his dog, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. So the, um, But he doesn't play it the same way that Dean Koontz does. Uh, he plays it a little more straight. Plain language, um, intelligent thoughts, uh, just very kind of basic uh, language, but still almost a human-like voice or consciousness to the animals, and you, you know Jack London has a lot of respect for these animals, uh, loves them, and, and can also feel that intelligence within them. So he does, he, he writes about them in very kind of flattering type ways. So uh, you mentioned uh, the cat books by yeah, Lillian the Jackson. Who, the yes. cat who, the cat who. Yeah, the cat who did this, the cat who did that. Um, Light Mysteries, Cozy Mysteries uh, by Lillian Jackson Braun, um, about a retired city newspaper editor becomes the editor of a small newspaper in a small town and uh, Siamese cats, he has two Siamese cats and they always play a role in the solving of the, the murder. They seem to always know more than he does, but of course they keep it to themselves because they are after all cats. Um, 
So people aren't deserving of their knowledge, but they come through for them. Uh, and so those cats play an important role. It's kind of amazing how many people uh, use animals as characters in their books, not just as uh, props, uh, characters. And, and when we say characters, how is an animal acting like a character? I would define it as an animal that plays a part in the, the plot. Um, that is important to the forward momentum of the plot rather than like you say a prop or a set piece um, that they are earning their space especially if they're a perspective uh, if, if you get into the perspective of the animal then they're definitely functioning as a character in that regard there so uh, something more than the dog that just rubs up against the leg um, or the cat that falls asleep in the the sunlight um, these these animals are generally active um, and working toward a particular goal. Characters have motivation, right? And so if, if the animal has a motivation, then they are a character. If, however, the character, the, the animal is just there um, as a prop, as a set piece, then it doesn't have that same kind of motivation or consciousness to it. And so I would say that those animals are not acting like characters within the, the, the fiction. Right. Another way to look at it is uh, by using the definition of personality. Uh, in theology, they define uh, personality, probably in psychology too, uh, as having uh, as a person who has intellect, emotion, and will. You have those three things, and you have personhood: intellect, I think; emotion, I feel; and will, I make decisions. And uh, those where the animals are playing a significant role, uh, they have all of those things. They have enough intelligence to. Uh, be admired. Uh, they certainly have emotion of some sort or another that touches the reader's heart, and then they make decisions. Lassie, uh, for example, always pulling you know, Timmy out of the well. Flipper, uh, think about Flipper too. The dolphin uh, always showed a, showed personality, intelligence, uh, willingness to sacrifice self, uh, and so in a sense, an animal is a, a different type of person, a different type of human almost. And I think that's why we connect to them. Uh, animals have been so much a part of human history that we really can't separate us, separate ourselves from, even if we don't like pets, uh, we generally like certain kinds of animals. Uh, we don't like all kinds of animals, but uh, we like certain kinds of animals. So Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the most famous examples of this is Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Um, you've got this the killer whale, which is not a killer whale, but a, a sperm whale, but it's a killer sperm whale. Is this confusing yet? Is anybody confused? It's not an it's orca. Sperm. Yeah, it's not an orca. Go ahead and check Spark Notes if you need to double check that. But uh, it's this giant white whale that's kind of the embodiment of, of all that is evil, etc. And so it's somewhat allegorical in a lot of ways, uh, symbolic, definitely. Um, but definitely has uh, emotion, will, and intellect. Uh, and you see that throughout. And and there it's used here we have an animal definitely used as an antagonist as a foil if you will or perhaps a, a, perhaps a mirror for captain ahab if you want to look at it in that regard um to that reveals ahab's character a little more fully um and so you've got the the use of an animal there a large rather large animal in fact yeah and in a possible situation so much uh, larger out in a sea difficult to find, uh, and the whale almost uh, shows up as if he wants to be found. Um, and it's story Melville basis on a story where a whale attacked a whaling ship. Um, and so from that, he built the rest of the story. What would it be like to have been that captain? And then what effect would it have on you emotionally, personally, psychologically? And uh, of course, Ahab is a fabulous character, scary as can be. Um, uh, there's been a couple of movies. Uh, oh, help me out! The guy that played uh, Jean-Luc Picard on the uh, uh, Star Trek. Um, Captain, uh, man, Patrick Patrick Stewart. Patrick there Stewart. we go. Yeah. Patrick Stewart. Sir Patrick Stewart. Yeah, and Sir Patrick uh, played uh, Ahab in a, a series on television. It was just fabulous because uh, he got all the the nuance of crazy in there. I'm I'm going to have to Netflix that, but he also quotes Moby Dick in. Star Trek The Next Generation movie, uh, First Contact. What is it, where his chest a cannon, he would have opened it and shot his heart upon the beast or something like that. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Just that great, great stuff. 
That was also, uh, I think it was a line that was used in the uh, first version of uh, Star Trek that had Khan, uh, Ricardo Montalban. So in Star Trek Classic, uh, or was that Milton? From the depths of hell I spit at thee. Um, <coughs> from the something. From hell's hot I stab at thee. It's something yeah. like that. I, can't, I, I didn't always going to have to quote that, so I don't remember it. Yeah. And I, now I can't remember if it was Milton or, or uh, Moby Dick, but I'll have to look that up. I feel like maybe Shakespeare. Star Trek often goes back to Shakespeare. Yeah, they did. They did some Shakespeare, but uh, I shouldn't have brought it up until I could confirm that. So I apologize, to everyone, but I'm going to plead uh, illness since I, I'm ill. I can you know, try to at least use it. Now, now I feel like uh, uh, like I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, <laughs> I feel like we've got sidetracked. There we go. Like a there we go. Yeah. Back to back to animals. You also mentioned Robin Cook uh, in coma. He's got a dog in that. Uh, he he does. Uh, Coma was his, I think, first book, uh, Dr. Robin Cook. I always felt odd because he was writing cookbooks because <laughs> his name's Cook. But anyway, um, he used it to make the bad guy seem really, really bad. And that's one of the things that can be done with animals. It was a cocker spaniel. Uh, and we used to have a cocker spaniel. And so I'm reading this and I'm thinking, oh, no, you don't. No, you do not kill the cocker spaniel. Well, he does. He kills the cocker spaniel. Uh, the book's been out for decades, so I'm not. Hopefully, I'm not spoiling anything. But I was furious with the uh, antagonist, and my my first thought is: one, he's got to die; two, he's got to die hard; and three, he's got to die slow. Um, and that cemented my hatred for him as a reader. So it was a good thing to do from a writer's point of view, um, but I've I've not been able to forget it. Um, I said one and read on other Robin Cook work, but. Uh, you know, there there's a uh, comic book that I read years ago. I can't even remember what it was, but I just remember there was a lonely security guard, and he would come home, and there was this little like white cocker spaniel that just loved him, and he would he would just you know nobody else at home. It was just he lived alone in this cocker spaniel, and he would come home and he would talk to this cocker spaniel. And I remember there was some sort of you know fight, superheroes, supervillains, whatever. His apartment gets thrashed, and as he's digging through the rubble, he finds his his poor dog and the dog is dead and he just, you know, weeps. And I remember being so affected by that comic book. Yeah. And I, I don't remember what it was, but I just, I can remember those panels in vivid detail. Um, and, and having that same thought, like somebody needs to be burned at the stake. Like there needs to be blood right now because yeah. like, you know, just, I, I partially because we did have that Cocker Spaniel, I immediately felt that connection. And then to see it ruptured like that in, in such a way is, is, very provocative, emotionally provocative uh, for the readers. So uh, it's definitely another way that you can use them. Uh, I think of Rudyard Kipling, who often wrote about uh, animals, uh, more exotic animals, and the kind of the jungle animals, etc. Mm -hmm. Of course, most famous work, Ricky Tikki Tavi. Most uh, you know, junior high kids are going to read that. Um, maybe elementary school, depending on what grade they're in, etc. Uh, but here entirely written from the perspective of animals and here comes this mongoose into this family of humans uh, but it's also you know having conversations with snakes in the garden and with birds and with uh, other animals and so all of the animals there are personified and this is another way that authors use animals is characterizing them uh, personifying them letting them speak to other animals obviously mongooses don't speak to snakes generally speaking um, but in, in fiction, of course, that can happen and it can give uh, a voice to the natural instincts of the animal and give insights into uh, how they, they live their lives and their motivations, etc. So it's, it's one of the enchanting kind of aspects of that is getting to pull that curtain back a little bit and see kind of the mindset of animals and, and you know, almost from a scientific standpoint, what are their motivations and, and what drives them to do what they do. So another good example there. I'm just uh, I'm just thinking of Jonathan Livingston Siegel, the story about seagulls. Of course, when you read it, you realize it's not about seagulls; it's about people. But all of it takes place with a flock of seagulls uh, and their their fight for life. So sometimes, uh, when when you do that, there, there's been some that's been done with rabbits. Um, it's really a way of portraying society uh, in a, a more what's the word I want to use here? Shadowed way, a little more. Um, fantasy way so you could say things you couldn't say otherwise if they were people uh so there's 
I think uh, one of the reasons that people do that, uh, the Lion King, for example, there's quite a bit. They're all animals. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all animals. Animal uh, farm. By the way, the quote is from Herman Melville. It's to the last I grapple with thee. From hell's heart I stab at thee. For hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. Um, so I just wanted from to Milton? make sure. Nope, that was Herman Melville. I just wanted everyone to know that for oh. once I was oh. right. I probably just stumbled into it, but. Yeah, that happens sometimes. No matter how hard I try, sometimes I still end up right. So, um, you've got a couple more examples here, and I want to move through them quickly because I want to talk a little bit about how we can do that as writers. But uh, you mentioned the yearling, and then we'll then the the last example obviously is probably one of the best examples. But uh, you mentioned the yearling, and this is something that I wasn't actually familiar with. So, what do you what do you know about the yearling? Well, the yearling was written uh, by Marjorie Keenan Rawlings, uh, and it was back in 1938. Uh, and it's it's just heartrending uh, story. It had been Book of the Month Club in 38. It sold a ton of books in 38 and 39. Uh, it went into all kinds of different languages, uh, and then it won a Pulitzer Prize in 1939. I mean, that's just really quick. Published in 38, won a Pulitzer in 39. Um, and of course, one of the interesting things is uh, her editor was Maxwell Perkins. We've talked about him uh, a couple of times. There's a great biography on him, but but he who also uh, edited Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald and really so many others, Thomas Wolfe and the like, and she followed everything he had to say. He wrote one of the best books. The Yearling uh, is is about a deer, and it's kind of a convoluted story where. Uh, the mother is somewhat separated from the son because she had lost two previous children, so she had trouble bonding. In the story, she's bitten by a snake, and the belief of the day was if you used a deer liver, you could suck out the poison with the deer liver. So she killed a deer, did that, but a fawn was left behind, and her son ends up taking care of the fawn. Uh, and then and what you do as a writer, of course, is you always make things worse, and as the fawn grows up and becomes... Uh, bigger, it starts eating their corn, which is causing them problems about survival, and uh, then they have to get rid of that. Uh, but very famous book. I had to read it in school, um, not in the 30s. Um, I wasn't around then, but I did have to read it in the school, uh, and uh, I always found it poignant. I don't know why they do that. You teachers do that to us, you know, make us read stuff that uh, makes us want to cry in class. So, Where the red fern grows. Yeah, yeah. Are this one Old Yeller? Yeah, Old Yeller. Nice. There you go. 1956. Uh, uh, I still haven't forgiven the uh, author, Fred Gibson, uh, for this. Uh, and it was made into a movie. Uh, Fess Parker, Tommy Kirk, others, Dorothy McGuire. But uh, Old Yeller is, uh, is a dog that snuck into the this boy's life, and then the owner comes to try and steal it away, and there's a conflict, and the dog protects him from his previous owner, but they end up trading a meal for uh, the dog. Um, it's all well and good, and a wolf attacks, and the dog goes after the wolf. Dog ends up with rabies, and the boy has to kill the dog. And of course, what this is is a cycle of growing up. This is coming of age kind of stuff. And I know it's really sad, especially when it's condensed that way. But to have a young person grow very affectionate, really they owe the dog. Uh, you know, much of their survival, and then something happens to the dog that requires that they, not the disease, because uh, they're afraid the, the dog's going to spread the disease, they have to put the dog down themselves. And, you know, <laughs> those are the it, kind of books I read once, and then I just uh, do my best to forget them if I can. <laughs> I, I'm actually thinking of a, a great short story by Amy Hempel. Um, who uh, was edited by the same guy who edited uh, Raymond Carver, Gordon Lich, that is, that's his name, um, called In the Cemetery Where Al Jolson is Buried. One of the saddest things I've ever read. It has to do, um, there's some sad human parts, but there's a, an even sadder animal part, and the animal part just rips my heart out. Makes yeah, it, yeah. It's so tough to go back to. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to read that, it's... Uh, it's worth reading once, and then I don't, I'm not sure if I'm strong enough to read it again. Sure. No, really, really tough stuff. But um, 
I'll, yeah. I won't spoil it for you. I'll let you guys read it. And I think the thing from a, a writer's point of view is we need to realize we don't have to make them cute little cuddly things always. There's a, there's a lot of uh, empathy for um, uh, King Kong. Sure, it's say Godzilla. Mm -hmm. Not so much for Godzilla, but for King Kong. Um, because he has a lot of human qualities. He's swayed by love. Um, but in the end, he has to be destroyed because he's attacking other people. So it's it, it's that conflict. So you could have something that's very strong and still feel uh, very attached, such as King Kong. Absolutely. So so how do we use animals in our fiction? Well, the first thing that we, we talked about earlier was revealing character. Uh, from something as simple as a cat person or a dog person. Or do they like cats? Do they hate cats? Uh, people think I hate cats because I, I call them tacos all the time. That has nothing to do with, with cats themselves. It's just a, a stupid joke that became a running joke, and now it's it's just ingrained in me. But um, I prefer dogs. I like dogs more. Uh, so that tells you a little bit about what kind of a character I am. Uh, specifically, how do they treat animals? This is really going to tell us... Uh, who our characters are. Are they loving? Are they doting? Um, you, see, you see some people who let their dogs kiss them on the lips, which is a little weird to me. Uh, that might be a little bit too much love, but at some point that's perfectly normal for other people. Um, so, you know, then then there are those who are uh, abusive. I don't want to, you know, pull out the name Michael Vick, but uh, we saw the huge public outcry when we saw how he was directly involved in, in the treatment of animals. Uh, that forms, uh, helps us form an opinion of those characters by the way they treat those animals. Right. Um, it does define the person, and there is a difference between uh, cat people and dog people. Uh, we've had cats, like them fine. Um, I don't know if they always like us. What's, what's the old saying that dogs have owners, cats have staff? Um, yeah. So that, that may be part of the uh, the problem there. But uh, cats, of course, have been part of royal families back in Egypt. Uh, I don't recall seeing as many in books. You know, we mentioned the Cat Who books and stuff, but um, those are, are certainly viable. Uh, and the way they treat their, uh, their animals. Because um, if you're a dog person, and I'm a dog person. Your sister brought over their little puppy, and I was a six-year-old. I was, I'll go see the dog. And next thing I know, I'm on the floor playing with the dog and teaching it to untie people's laces because I'm just that mean. Um, dog was quick to pick that up, too. I'm the only one proud about it. But anyway, um, yeah. I was having the best time being a kid again with this little puppy. Uh, so, yeah, we, we learned something about ourselves that way. So, uh, and how they uh, treat the animals, uh, one of those scenes that have stayed with me forever was the primary protagonist in Stephen King's The Dead Zone early on. It's years before he becomes the one we normally think of him uh, as, uh, but he kicks a, an aggressive dog to death. You know, and I remember reading that thinking, well, I don't like this guy. I'm going to, I'd probably root for the dog. Of course, the dog was aggressive, but nonetheless, uh, you, what it did is it revealed his temper, his meanness, and his brutality uh, because he does it with great gusto. And so that tells us a lot about him without Stephen King having to tell us, well, oh, this guy's got some serious problems. He shows us that he has serious problems. Absolutely. And I don't think anybody's, I mean, there, there are no winners in that one, right? We've got an aggressive dog and then you've got an aggressive human being and at some point we don't like either one of them but um yeah it, it really reveals who they are um and, and the way that they treat their animals uh you know animals are also a a ploy sometimes i don't like seeing them used as a ploy but uh it's easy sympathy right we talk about there's a a, a great book on screenwriting called save the cat based around this idea that uh, your character at some point should save the cat. They should do something heroic. They should do something that's going to endear them to the audience. And, you know, the easiest way to do that is you save the cat from the gunfight. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. Even though there are larger stakes, um, the character still is willing to put themselves on the line to save a, a helpless or defenseless animal. Uh, so it can be kind of a sympathy ploy. Uh, the the um, Dean Koontz... Uh, was it Watchers that you mentioned? 
where mm -hmm. the the dog dies. That's easy sympathy, right? It immediately aligns your reader with the good guy and aligns them against the bad guy as well. So some some good stuff with that. Uh, easy sympathy it can also provide a sounding board for your characters to talk to. Uh, I go back to this example of. Uh, the, the, the comic book that I read where you've got this nighttime security guard and, and his dog is his only friend. And, you know, I, I feel for that guy. Like, he's just a genuinely cool guy. And I know because he was talking to his animal. He was loving his animal. He was caring for his animal. Um, you know, he talked to his animal about his day. So I got to know this, him as a person a little bit better. Um, you know, it's the, the, when, the, when the character has no one else to talk to and you've got a dog jump in their lap, here is a great opportunity to have your character vocalize a lot of what they're feeling inside. So it's a good opportunity for that as well. Yes. Yeah, so they can be much more than props, uh, though sometimes they, uh, they can make very worthwhile props uh, and meaningful ones. Uh, may not be a huge part of the story, but they can reveal a great deal uh, about the character, especially if they uh, provide some kind of help to the owner you know, attempts to save the owner's life or something like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You were going to say something? Uh, no, I was going to pass it on over uh, to you, I thought. But, uh, oh. uh, well, let, let's talk a little bit about this, uh, the provi uh, providing sounding boards uh, for uh, your characters. I had a friend who was having trouble with his early scenes in a book. And this problem was, this uh, was a man going through one of the national uh, forests, and he was going to do some camping and stuff, and he's out there doing that. And the writer was trying to portray the kind of man he was. You know, and so it was all internal dialogue, all just thought and uh, those sorts of things, and it didn't carry very well. And I mentioned that to him. Um, I said, you know, you need some dialogue or something to carry this off a little. And he said, uh, I don't know how to do that. I said, well, the, the guy's an outdoorsman. Give him a dog, uh, which is what he did, uh, because people talk to animals like they understand. Um, some of them do understand some things, but, you know, we talk to them like uh, you could sit down and uh, debate issues about Socrates with them or something. Uh, and the great thing is they'll sit and listen, you know, especially dogs. They have no idea what you're saying, but they just want to hear your voice. Uh, and by giving him someone to talk to, in this case, the someone being a dog, uh, it smoothed the writing, it uh, cut down on the narration, and it made things flow. Plus, we saw that the guy really likes his dog, and the dog is, becomes uh, essential to the story. Absolutely. And it's, it's something that the audience can easily relate to. You know, Like you say, dogs are fantastic listeners. Cats are, can't sleep a lot. Uh, and dogs are fantastic listeners. So giving them, you know, a, a way to provide that sounding board to get into the, the mindset, um, it can be almost therapeutic for your, your character in the sense that the more they talk to this animal, sometimes the more they understand their own feelings. If they come home agitated or irritated, uh, the way they interact with the, the animal can help uh, soothe them. Uh, the, the gentleman that we had train our dog, fantastic fantastic dog trainer um and he came in and he, he said you know anyone can train a dog um to be obedient by beating them you know beating them whenever they're disobedient he says the real trick is to to teach a dog to obey without breaking its spirit without you know crushing its its personality and i've seen dogs that have been abused and you know just tails are tucked between their legs and they they want to love you, but they're afraid of you at the same time, and it's just a horrible place for those poor animals to be. Um, and and there's there's a lot to be said about animals that are well treated and therapy dogs. Uh, that's kind of the point I was trying to get to. Is the guy who trained our dog is, trained therapy dogs as well. Um, it, the, he would take these dogs into hospitals, and patients would have noticeable increases and in, and in benefits from interacting with these animals. It, it releases these endorphins and, and creates these bonds that help help us to heal in a lot of ways. So the power of these dogs uh, and these other animals, these rescue animals, these therapy animals, can be very powerful and very profound for our characters. Right, right. And, and they are, if you know people that use those kinds of dogs, 
uh, you see a bond that goes on there. Uh, Edie Melson, who uh, visits with us sometimes and is the co-director, uh, she has a son back from um, uh, the wars, and he has uh, a therapy dog, a, a help dog, an aid dog, something like that. And uh, he was gone, and so she was keeping the dog, and I got to meet him. A big, big black lap. Great dog. Great, great dog. Um, so, and uh, I got attached to the dog. The dog just attaches himself to other people. But, of course, he goes nuts when uh, his owner gets back. So, and it says a lot about the owner. And in writing, it says a lot about the characters that deal with the dog. Um, so, Absolutely. yeah, I'm even thinking of little things like Ratatouille, you know, the mice and uh, stuff like that. Like you get a, quite an attachment uh, yeah. if you change them a little bit. Uh, finding Nemo, right? You've got, they're all animals. They're interacting there, but you've got a few human characters. And what is it? The little girl who like, mis, you know, abuses the fish and the fish are always dying in her bag. And, you know, the dentist who goes out to, to get her new fish because he loves his, his niece or whatever it is. Um, yeah. It, it tells us a lot about these characters. Right. Um, but they're not just a sounding board. They can also be a source of conflict, whether they're a character or not. So you think of, you know, the simple lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, you know, if, you, if you're writing a romance, perhaps, uh, perhaps you love the girl, but you hate her dog. You know, there's some conflict there. I had some friends. I don't know what this says about me. I had some friends, and when I came over, they said, watch out for our dog. He hates all men. He hates men. And that dog loved me. I don't. I don't, I don't know what it says about me. Thing or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm admitting this on the air, but that dog loved me. It hated pretty much any other man that walked through the door. But for whatever reason, I like to think that I've got a way with animals, sure. a certain way with animals, you know. But, uh, um, you know, uh, Jenny Snow was, was mentioning uh, that in the romances that she reads, oftentimes the, uh, what is it? She says, in, often in romance novels, the hero's pet will have an unusual affinity for the heroine. So the guy's dog likes the girl that he also likes or whatever, or, or she's got the dog that hates all men, but for whatever reason likes this guy. And so, you know, maybe there's going to be something here. So um, using them as a judge of character is something else that we didn't put on there. But um, animals, I think, are pretty good judges of character. Uh, they, they, if you treat them well, they treat you well. If you don't treat them well, they generally don't like you. Uh, yeah. And so you can, you can do a lot there. But um, as well as the source of conflict, uh, you can have the the sources of phobia, right? Um, mm. You think of Indiana Jones, snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? You know, and um, but he's okay with rats, but his dad is afraid of rats. Oh, why is it rats? You know, so it it's kind of becomes a joke, and it's it's fun and and playful. But at some point, you know, arachnophobia is a real thing, sure. and so you can have animals there creating conflict for your characters. Yeah, and that's it for me is uh, insects. I don't like insects. I can put up with a lot of things, but the, the insects I don't care much for, especially if they sting. And if they have wings and they can sting, then I just, I don't. I don't like them at all. So I leave them alone. I don't have much of an issue with them, but ants. Oh, I can't. You know, I saw the ants the other day. I, I thought, I'm burning the house down. There's ants in my house. I'm burning it down. <laughs> it's okay with me. It's fine. But I'll they did a, a new movie house. or two. Did they do a movie or two uh, with ants? Uh, uh, an animated movie. What they did, of oh. course, is they made them human. Um, yeah. But just uh, in ant bodies, so you know all the emotions and stuff are human. So uh, still hate them. Yeah, I still couldn't do that. Alrighty, you have a, a few guidelines here about how to use animals, and the first one is you just say. Uh, yeah, not to kill them. Uh, killing, killing animals is a good way to alienate your readers uh, unless it's done properly. We've already talked about Dean Koontz and Watchers. Um, you can sometimes pull it off. But the general rule of thumb is there's going to be some serious heck to pay if you let an animal die. Um, you can put them in peril, and that ups the stakes. You can use them as, as additional uh, conflict in that way, raising the stakes. Um, the animals that they love are now on the line. Think of things like, you know, kind of a black beauty or, or some of those other ones that deal with horses and the horse has to be taken away or whatever the case may be. Um, it's okay if they're in peril or if they're taken away, but 
if you kill an animal, uh, it's a good way to tick off a lot of readers. And so that one, I think, is kind of a buyer beware. Uh, if you want to kill off an animal just to, to simply kind of make it a quick emotional play for the reader, um, you know, I, I would caution you against using them as a gimmick. But at the same rate, uh, you know, really balance it. If, if the story calls for it, and this is going to be kind of a, a turning point in the life of your character, and it's going to be something that rockets them on to, you know, to push them through that final door, if we're using the three-act structure to push them from act two to act three, um, you know, you, you might be able to do it, but just understand you're going to get some letters. Uh, you're going to get some, you're going to ruffle a lot of feathers if we can use an animalistic kind of a... a ruffle feathers. Ruffle, yeah, feathers. feathers. ruffle feathers. Yeah. I see what you're doing there. <laughs> yeah. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. <laughs> <laughs> you say also to make them natural. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well... In the same way we talked uh, when we did our episode about writing for women and writing about women, et cetera, you don't want a woman for the woman's sake. You don't want uh, the bad guy for the bad guy's sake. If, if you're going to have a character that loves dogs, give them a dog. Give them two dogs. If you're going to have an, an, a character that doesn't care, don't try and give them a dog. Don't try and give them a cat. Just let them be who they are. Um, if, if it's vital to your character, put them in. But... Um, don't just shoehorn it in. I, I, I'm, afraid, I'm always afraid that when we do topics like this, that people will be like, I don't have a dog in my fiction. I need to put one in right now. Not necessarily. If the novel doesn't call for it, you don't, you don't do it. I don't have a, like I say, in, in the, my current work in progress. As a matter of fact, I think I've only written one book, I guess technically the series, the Hand of Adonai series, where there's actually an animal that's a constant companion that, that is there. And, it's it's the way I, I handled it is um, the character is named Erica and she's a caller so she can call these animals she can communicate with them and the irony is that she hates animals <laughs> like in, in the real world she hated animals but then when she gets sucked into this video game that's all she does is interact with animals and it really opens up her character in a lot of ways because she didn't think she liked animals but she finds herself quickly becoming attached to them um, so in that way um, I did it kind of for the sake of irony, but also because I wanted it to be a source of character growth and development for her. None of the other characters need an animal, but she kind of needed one. She needed that extra element that was going to help her kind of open up a little bit. So I put them in there. Don't just throw in the animals for the sake of having an animal. You don't want a cat for the sake of a cat. You think of the cat who books. They make a difference. They're involved. You think of even under the dome, that dog has a part to play in the story. So if that's going to be important to your character or to the fiction, then definitely put them in. Otherwise, don't just try and shoehorn it in just because you feel like you're checking off a box. Yeah, I I don't use many animals like that, pets especially, uh, in my writing. It's just not something that's come up. Uh, I'm not opposed to it, but I never had a need. I'm trying to look at some of my books over here in, in which uh, that was necessary. I mean, there are animals and stuff. Crime Scene Jerusalem, the first animal we see is a very sick camel that is you just don't want to see with a bowel problem. Um, okay, but it has very little to do with the story, but it has to do with how my character responds to suddenly being in the first century. Uh, so if it, if it fits, if it's a natural outgrowth like anything else, then a pet can be... Uh, uh, a great addition to the story or some other kind of animal. Uh, you know, so it could be dog, cat, but it could be anything else. It could be uh, Jane Goodall with a chimpanzees. Um, it could be any number of things. So when I locked into it, but I would say this, that if you're going to put such an animal, whatever type, you're doing Doctari, so he's a veterinarian in, the, uh, in Africa. If you're going to do that kind of thing, you need to do some research. So... If you're going to talk about dogs, you're going to talk about a golden uh, retriever, you need to know somebody who has a golden retriever. If you're going to talk about cocker spaniels, you need to know about that. If you know somebody who has uh, five cats at home, you know, what does it take to uh, keep a cat? What's the thing you hate most about it? What's the thing you love most about it? Uh, you know, some, if you're going to have somebody with a collection of wild animals, you're going to have to do some research, uh, just like you would anything else, so that you'll be accurate in the portrayal. Research is definitely important. Um, I would also encourage a variety of animals. Uh, cats and dogs, obviously, very popular. But in, in, in terms of 
uh, pets. There's also fish. There's also birds. There's also snakes, um, lizards, turtles, uh, frogs. I mean, you name it. Stroll through PetSmart and take a look around. Um, go to the you know the the shelter, animal shelter, and see what they've got there. And, and you you'd be surprised at what it, some of the things that they have. Um, I've got uh, I've got a fish. One of my characters in, in my book has a fish, a goldfish that he becomes very att uh, attached to, and it's one of those things that uh, becomes a source of kind of comedy. Obviously, this fish is not talking to him, but he kind of becomes attached to this fish. Um, and partially because I've got fish, as, as you might be able to tell from my very dark fish tank behind me, can't find lights that you know last more than two minutes. But uh, I do like fish, uh, and most of them survive in my house for uh, a while. But uh, you know, think about that. The other thing is you want to be specific. So if you're talking about the dog, then it's not just a dog; it's a cocker spaniel, it's a golden retriever, it's an Irish setter, it's a you know a Great Dane. Whatever it is, the type, I mean, if you, we talked about being a cat person or a dog person, but what kind of dog do you get? Um, are you going to get those, like, chihuahuas? I don't understand people who want, like, chihuahuas. If you want a chihuahua, go buy a cat or, or a mouse. I mean, it's the same thing, but um, not my cup of tea. But I like some of the kind of the middle-sized dogs, some of the small middle-sized dogs, the Cocker Spaniels that we had growing up I really liked. We had a half Samoyed, half German Shepherd that was mm -hmm. just a great dog. But some of these dogs, especially German Shepherds, they're work dogs. They're high energy. They don't stop running ever. And so knowing that and how these dogs behave is going to be important. Uh, not just a cat, but maybe a tabby cat or a Siamese cat or um, whatever other kind of breed there is with cats. Not a snake, but a rosy boa, um, you know, a garter snake. Um, uh, not just a fish, but uh, a black fin tetra. Fish have some fantastic names, by the way. Um, you know, uh, the, the uh, what are they called? The bala sharks that you can get for your takes. We used to have bala sharks back there. Just really, really cool looking fish, you know, little torpedo shape and black fins and, you know, silver bodies and very sleek and, and smooth. And um, so knowing that, you know, what's, what is in their fish tank and, you know, what, what birds do they have in their cages? And we got birds, uh, if you remember Pops, we had birds for a while and we thought they were great until nighttime and they wouldn't shut up. And it's like, stop your tweeting, you know, like <laughs> stop your chirping, we're trying to sleep. And you're just talking it up. So, Even if you covered them up? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Wow. We couldn't get them to talk during the day, but then you cover them at night, and it's still just chirping, chirping, chirping. So, yeah, we've had uh, we've had birds, cockatiels, canaries, finches. I used to love the finches. You know, and here, listening to you talk, I, I'm now getting more animal books, especially dog books. You mentioned Irish setter, and we had a lovely Irish setter. Uh, but there was a book called Big Red about an Irish setter, which made me think of Weep No More My Lady, which is a story about an African barkless dog called a Basenji, a little curly tail, most sensitive sense of smell in the dog world, but it doesn't bark. And so it's kind of a unique story there. But if you're going to write about that, you need to know uh, about those kinds of dogs. Again, if you're going to be writing about great apes, you know, crocodiles, doesn't matter. If you're going to be writing about those kinds of things, you do have to do the research and be, as you say, specific. Yeah. Be specific, be sensitive to <coughs> to animal owners and, and um, where they're coming from. Uh, it's just like anything else. If you're going to write about any other character, you want to do some research, make sure you really know them and that you're being sensitive to them, etc. So... Uh, those are some ways that you can use animals in your fiction. Those are all the notes that we have. Uh, Pops, did you have any last-minute uh, additions at all? No, I, uh, I've kind of enjoyed it, uh, especially revisiting stuff from my childhood uh, reading and uh, being reminded how important, uh, how useful uh, an animal can be in a story. Um, I would just say do uh, be broad in your thinking. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be a dog. It can be any number of animals which we've seen, um, they may have short service in the book. They may be the whole book itself. So that'll be your decision as a writer. I'd also encourage you to think outside your personal box. There's always our, our um, tendency as writers to write characters who are like us. So for dog people, they're going to have dogs. And if we're cat people, they're going to have cats, etc. But, you know, really challenge yourself. Think of, think of people who are not like you. Uh, if you hate cats, maybe write about a cat lover. 
and just see what that's yeah. like. Try and you know see things from their perspective. Uh, it's a challenge. You'll have to do some research. You may not enjoy it, but if you can really tap into those types of characters and and their motivations and their desires, you're gonna understand uh, people in a new way, and your fiction is gonna feel that much more authentic, um, and it's gonna feel unique too. It's gonna feel a little more original, um, a little more natural, rather than just reading the same stories about the same kind of dog, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What makes the examples that we listed today so memorable is that they were specific and that they were um, research-based, that these are people who you know have, knew what they were writing about, um, and, and the interaction, specifically Rudyard Kipling's uh, Ricky Tikki Tabby, um, which really kind of pulls back the curtains on some of those instincts that that run uh, long through the the animals, etc. Uh, so challenge yourself. Have some fun with it too. Have some fun with it too. A lot of things you can do with that. So uh, we don't have any questions on our on our uh, site tonight. So uh, I'll just kick it back over to you, pops. And uh, how can people get in touch with you? Well, um, just the usual way, altongansky.com. I am on Facebook. Uh, I'm on YouTube, at YouTube slash Alton Gansky, and uh, I'm also on the Twitterator, Twitter. Um, it's all easy to find. Excellent. And I am on Facebook at facebook.com slash Aaron D. Gansky. That's my author page where you can find the first in fiction, or I'm sorry, the first line Fridays that I'll be doing. I'll be putting another one up there on on this Friday. Uh, you can also find me at AaronGansky.com, which is where I uh, have these blogs with the YouTubes and the audio downloads available there. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube at YouTube.com slash, I believe it's user slash Aaron Gansky is what it's under. And so lots of ways to get in touch with us, and we love hearing from you guys, love your comments. So uh, let, us, let us know. Give us a, a shout-out and uh, tell your friends. And uh, until next week, good writing. <laughs>